Hello. Uh, it's Writing Wednesday, and I am at the Santa Barbara uh, Writing Conference. So this is yet another hotel room. Uh, very attractive. And uh, I thought we'd talk about, uh, continue talking about dialogue uh, as we... Uh, sort of scratched the surface last week, there's a lot to talk about because um, dialogue is the culmination, the dialogue scene is the culmination of all the, everything that you can do in writing, uh, you need to do in a dialogue scene. So we talked about last week uh, what dialogue was for. Hey. Um, we talked about... Uh, uh, that dialogue tells us about the relationship between two people as they push against each other. Um, that dialogue is only for conflict. Uh, you're not going to throw uh, the bathtub in the kitchen sink uh, and all that exposition into the dialogue, uh, into the utterance, that you can use everything. You don't have to um, um, stick to, you know exposition and dialogue and telling us all about uh, some complicated project. You can just narrate it. Uh, you can get it much faster and uh, much more information in plain old exposition. The dialogue is just for the pressure of, char of character against character, and someone wins and someone loses. So who wins the dialogue scene? And it's a scene like any other scene we describe in scene and story that something has to happen. Uh, you can't leave the same way you came in. You have to have gone through something and had a change. So um, last week we showed how there's no way to have a decent dialogue scene where everybody agrees. If everybody agrees, you don't need the scene that it's just for conflict, uh, because conflict produces the change. Uh, conflict produces movement, uh, something. You're also seeing the characters in action, and um, uh, what I'd like to talk about today is how the best dialogue is always going to be between people who know each other very well. Uh, strangers don't get into it, generally speaking, or if they do, they get into it in a very generic way. Um, whereas people who know each other very well, the conflict is always simmering under the surface. And dialogue, people don't have to say a lot uh, for the dialogue to be very vivid. As we talked about last week, compression is the soul of good dialogue on the page. Um, uh, Here's a question. What about internal dialogue? Internal, there is no such thing as internal dialogue. Well, I guess I, you can argue with yourself. Fine. Um, but uh, usually internal thoughts, um, they're thoughts. It's usually not a, a dialogue situation. It can be, though, if you talk to yourself uh, and co have conflict with yourself. Um, but the better the characters know each other, the more pressure they can put on each other. Um, just like, I mean, and what you want is the least amount of spoken word that carries the most meaning and the most power, the most conflict. Um, and you use all of the other elements of the dialogue, of scene, to carry the rest. So... We talked about the Sunday last week, you know, and the dialogue being the actual utterance being the nuts on the Sunday, not the ice cream, not the hot fudge, not the bananas, not the whipped cream, the nuts. So you try to compress that dialogue, um, the utterance, to the most meaningful lines. And especially when two people know each other very, very well, they do not need to speak very much. Each line can have such power um, because they're already locked and loaded. You know, the conflicts are there under the surface, uh, which is not the case with strangers. Um, so you know how it is when you were a kid and you came in in your new dress and uh, your mother said, oh, is that what you're wearing? I mean, that's all she has to say. And they're, it's like, what do you mean? What's wrong with it? You know, um, 
because there's a world of experience, mutual experience, behind every line of dialogue of people who know each other very well. Um, so the best conflict is between people who know each other well. And I'm going to read a uh, little section of Joan Didion, who I admire. Her, she's you know you can tell the screenwriter in her. Uh, she's a minimalist, so the compression in the dialogue is incredibly good. This is a um, a uh, one, two, three, a six-line exchange of dialogue. When you are working in your dialogue, try not to have the dialogue, we talked about it last time, marching down the page with no description, no thoughts, no gestures, nothing. Um, if you think of dialogue as groups of utterances, so somebody speaks, somebody else says something that comments on that, and then the third line will tell you what the movement is. Does the, does the first person, how does the first person come back when the second person, say, offers a conflict line? Uh, how does the third person react will really set the tone of your dialogue. And you can practice doing dialogue in three line bursts. And then take a break. And then, So it's more like, not like 15 rounds with Tyson, you know, Mike Tyson, but more like the way cats fight, and then they break apart. Break apart. Think of your dialogue like that. Um, so here's a, a bit of dialogue from a wonderful book called A Play It As It Lays by Joan Didion. Hey. Um, and uh, it's a husband and wife. So Carter and M Mariah. What have you been doing, Carter said, the, the next time she saw him. That's a very basic line, right? Anybody could say that. What have you been doing? Uh, Carter said the next time she saw him. Working. I mean, I'm going to be working very soon. Well, what is, look, what, look what's happening already. So she's lying, first of all. I'm working. I'm going to be working. So she's we know this about their relationship, that she feels she has to lie to him. And two, that she's not very good at it. She's not a very strong liar. She doesn't believe in herself enough just to say working. <clears throat> what do you think of that? No, no, no. She says, uh, I'm going to be working. So she makes a statement, and then she, she negates her own statement, doesn't she? Um, I'm going to be working very soon. Oh, so who are you putting your money on already? I'm putting my money on Carter because she is a weak. She's weak. Her dialogue shows the weakness in the relationship. And, she's, and then he says, I mean, who have you been seeing? She says, nobody. Helene, BZ. BZ comes by sometimes. So again, we try to lie. Nobody. I've, I haven't been seeing anybody. Screw you. you. You have no right to ask me. No. She says, nobody. Oh, well, Helene. Oh, well, BZ. BZ comes by sometime. So she can't, she can't lie very well. She doesn't believe in herself. She doesn't know how to protect herself from this guy. Um, so again, Carter wins that second uh, exchange. And then listen to this. This is the third one. Uh, don't get into that, Carter said. And she replies, he's your friend, Mariah said. I mean, that is rotten. <laughs> so what that means is we have no idea. We haven't seen BZ and Helene. We have no idea who they are. We know. But the fifth line is, so her line is BZ comes by sometime. His line is, don't get into that. She doesn't explain it. She doesn't tell us what, what he's talking about. When you are writing dialogue, don't explain things. Don't explain. Because the reader will lean forward to try to, you know, then when BZ shows up the first time, we're going to be watching him because what the hell was Carter talking about? Don't get into that. 
Um, and then Mariah is her at little attack at the end as he's your friend. So I'm going to hold you responsible for whatever bad thing I'm doing to myself. So she's a little masochistic. She's going to manip- She's blaming it on him already. She hasn't done anything. I don't know what she's been doing. But we're going to blame it on Carter. So this is a marriage where they, she knows what he's talking about. We don't know what, we're ta- what they're talking about. But we can see the relationship between the two characters extremely clearly. And then the sparing use of attribution. Now, attribution. He said, she said, all that, you know... Try to skip the attributions. You can do attributions in a million ways. You can uh, do landscape attribution where, uh, um, don't get into that, she, Mariah stirred the pot on the stove. So we know it's Mariah because her action follows her dialogue or it could be the other way around. Mariah stirred the pot on the stove. Don't get into that. Uh, or no, that's not what she, that's not her line. He's your friend, so she, you don't even have to say he sh- said she said. I mean, this is a very minimal style. But in attributions, if you can get rid of them and still know who's talking, do so. Unless you use it for some sort of rhythmic purpose. Uh, but you can have an action attribution. I'm stirring the pot and said something. Um, you can do a thought attribution where uh, because people think while they're speaking so uh, don't get into that she uh, she noticed a quiver in his voice well if she can notice that she is uh, she is speaking or he's um, it's her line so you keep if she's the protagonist of the line uh, she thinks something. Uh, she thinks that Carter uh, can go to the, go to hell. He's your friend. Um, we know that it's her line. Um, so think about getting rid of the attribution. Uh, and then everybody knows that you don't have to, if you're going to say he said, just say he said. You don't have to say he bellowed or anything like that. Um, characters can lie. It's very interesting, you know, dialogue is not um, deposition. People can lie. It's very interesting. The other thing they can do is they can not answer. They can change the subject. I mean, this is wrestling. This is, you know, in combat, you don't just keep punching straight on. You know, you come around, you hit, you trip them, you know. You do all kinds of other sneaky things so you can change the subject, uh, you can stonewall, you can lie, you can do all kinds of stuff. And um, so this is uh, some minimalist dialogue, but uh, God, is she brilliant, uh, brilliant with dialogue. Um, so the best conflict is when people don't have to say very much. And don't explain, don't over-explain. If he says, you know, don't get into that, um, and we don't know what she's talking about, he's talking about, but she does, we're tracking that. Um, don't tell people more than they want to know. Tell people slightly less than they want to know, and they'll lean forward and uh, try to uh, understand um, understand what they're talking about. Um, here's another little note about exposition, is that you ha- try to remember that um, the reader and not the other character is the recipient of all information in a book, all um, dialogue. So if if we already know something, resist the temptation to have your character go and tell somebody else uh, in uh, in your story or book. because we already know, the reader already knows. So you can do it in the, mo- in the briefest way. You know, uh, how's Carol, um, Tom asked. We already know that Carol is all busted up in the hospital and stuff. So her answer should be more about their relationship than about the information about Carol in the hospital. Um, so that's what dialogue is for. Um, to remember that 
in life we go, something happens to us and we run to a friend and we immediately retell the story. But in fiction, the reader already knows. We do not have to have the character run to their friend and have coffee and have a muffin and rehash what we already know. Uh, if there's a reason for them to be there and there's going to be an, a new scene, new conflict with this friend, then you just convey it in the most interesting way, uh, maybe even something that differs from what we know happened. And that's really interesting. You know, we saw, we just saw her uh, uh, break Harold's trophy. Um, and then when she goes to talk to uh, Harold's friend, who she finds extra extremely attractive, she might say, uh, uh, Harold got really mad and smashed the trophy. When we all, we know damn well it's her. That's interesting. Um, so try not to have that repetitive thing. I see it a lot in beginner work um, because something happens. We, oh, in life, we run to our friends and rehash everything with four different friends. Uh, try to allow your character not to be so dependent on uh, the opinion of other people because uh, it's really boring. So now we, if you keep the di dialogue to conflict, you skip the meet and greet, uh, you don't have dialogue with people when you're buying donuts and nothing is happening, don't preach to the choir, um, watch the exposition, there's a lot less dialogue to write. If the utterance part is just going to be kept for the good stuff, for the conflict. There'll be a lot less dialogue, and the dialogue you write, you'll get more meaning out of each line. So let's talk about um, generic dialogue. So dialogue is a person brings their specific needs and wants into the arena to press against another person and their needs and wants. Um, it is something that two people do to each other. Don't get into that. He's your friend. Um, generic dialogue is a line that anybody could say. Anybody could say, huh, what do you mean by that? If a line is something that anybody could say, or anybody in any situation could say, don't have anybody say it. Because nobody wants to be the straight man. Huh? What do you mean by that? Nobody's going to do that. Nobody's going to be Ed McMahon on the couch. Um, you have to have everybody firing on all cylinders in dialogue on the page. Um, try not to set up a scene where one person gets all the good lines and the other person sets it up sets up all the lines. Imagine they're the best actors you can possibly think of who are playing these roles. And they're very touchy. And nobody, you know, that you're paying a million dollars is going to say, you know, maybe Sean Penn doesn't want to say that. Maybe that's not a good line. You have to give everybody a good line. You have to give even supporting players have to have the million dollar line, you're paying them too much. Um, and you don't want them to walk off the picture. Now that is really, really important when you're writing for the page, um, that there, there are no generic people and there are no generic lines. Every line has to be for that conflict, for that place in that conflict, telling us about that person and the relationship with the person they are talking to. Um, imagine Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee. You know, don't give them lines like, well, huh, what do you mean by that? Or groovy, or, you know. They, it has to mean something. It has to be worthy of these great actors. Um, so let's talk about good lines, good dialogue. So good dialogue reveals character. So everybody has their own diction, their own choice of words, vocabulary, the rhythms of speech, the way they string a sentence together, how long a sentence, how short a sentence. 
staccato, lyrical, um, do they frequently interrupt? Everybody has their own way of speaking and don't have two people who speak the same way in the same scene. You should be able to normally know who's speaking. Um, have you ever uh, read a scene with a number of characters, or even two characters, where as you read, you get lost and you can't tell who's speaking? And we think, oh, you know, it would have been better if they'd put some attributions in there. But no, it's because it's not well written. And you can, can't tell the characters apart by the way they speak. So that's just bad writing. Um, that uh, everyone has their own point of view, especially the point of view character. They have a take our spin on uh, and on uh, whatever they're talking about. They have an attitude that needs to be in the dialogue. Um, so as I said, I was starting to talk about um, the simplest dialogue exchange is a three-line exchange of dialogue. Someone says something, someone else replies, and then the third line reacts or tops it. Uh, and remember that dialogue is related to what the character wants. So their need, their hopes and dreams, their style of communicating point of view. So here's a, a boy interacting with um, a, his girlfriend's father. So we're looking for differential in the way people speak and what people want in the scene and who is going to win the exchange. So this is a three-line exchange. Hey, Mr. Baxter, Steve said, edging towards the door. Remember, gesture is part of the dialogue scene. Hey, Mr. Baxter, Steve said, edging towards the door. Wait one minute, said Mr. Baxter. I want to have a word with you, young man. You hear the voices. You're not gonna. You're not gonna confuse. Hey, Mr. Baxter, with I want to have a word with you, young man. It's clear, right? Now, what's the third line gonna be? It's Steve's, right? It's the kids. Uh, gotta go, Mr. B. So who wins that? Steve wins it. He's not going to fall into the um, uh, be dominated by Mr. B. He's gonna get out of there. So there's something else to talk about dialogue is uh, it's we talked we said that it's not deposition you don't have to tell the truth uh, that people lie they get belligerent they change the subject they sweet talk oh honey baby you know you don't mean that um, they apologize. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, they're not really sorry, maybe. But they use that to win, to win the dialogue, right? Uh, they apologize. They can, be, they can bully. Uh, they can use silence as a weapon. Did you hear what I said? Maybe not. Um, they changed the subject. Lying is very interesting in fiction, especially in fiction, because we know what the character's thinking. If it's a point of view character, especially, we know what the character's thinking. So it's like, of course I'd like to have dinner with you, honey. Uh, and then the thoughts are, I'd rather, you know, have my fingernails ripped out um, and uh, eat them. <laughs> so it gives great dimensionality to the scene. If because we always know what people are thinking as well as what they're saying. The best dialogue works against what you'd expect. If there is a line that you can guess, the reader can guess what the next line is, you should not write that line. If there's something that you expect the character to say, say something else. Uh... Be watching for, if your characters are good boxers, you know, they're not going to punch from the direction that is expected. They're going to 
startle someone, they get in their face, they, you know, they trip them, they do all kinds of stuff. Um, so get your people to be a little better fighters, a little dirtier. Um, in, so they, they circle one another, they try one thing and then they try another. So all the dialogue doesn't come from the same direction. It changes tone. It, there might be a little, and then they break apart and then somebody's going to try something else not coming back to the same, you know, from the same direction. Uh, in good dialogue, people play with each other's heads. Um, they try to get into a better position. So you can do that with your characters. You can think about, um, oh, that didn't work. Let's try something else. Let's, you know, let's do something else. Um, so it's a very good exercise that I'm going to uh, suggest that you try, um, which is the three-line dialogue scene, where each person's need and their relationship becomes clearly visible. So the dialogue can obviously go on, or there can be more steps. There can be another bout of it. But try for the three-line dialogue scene. A says something, B reacts, and then the third line, A's third line, tells you how that dialogue scene is going to play, who's going to win. Uh, and uh, it's good because you can learn to find the most significant lines and make them count. And you'll never have that coffee muffin thing happening to you. Um, so I really, really recommend that. And then as a version of this, after you've done, do seven or eight of those. Now, the best one is this one, which is to do a three-line dialogue scene. Again, A, B, A. But use a beat for silence. Now, if you've ever acted, I talked about this a little bit uh, last week. If you've ever acted, you'll see how silence can be more powerful than a spoken line. That whoever owns the silence owns the scene. Um, what? And then uh, I think it was Linda asked me uh, last week, what do you do with the, um, with the silence? How do you depict a silence? You depict a silence because you can hear other sounds once a person stop speaking. There are other sounds. You can look out the window. You can hear something. You can think something. You create the silence by putting other things in there. For instance, um, so it's, uh, you can fill it with thought, landscape, observation, gesture, especially sound. For instance, how come you can never be home on time, his mother said. Harold looked out the window. It looked like there was a party going on at, down at the Parkers. He wished he was there. I tried, he said. So you see, there's a pause before he speaks, and you've, because you filled it with other things. His mother heard laughter on the warm air. He could hear laughter on the warm air. His mother ran a hand through her graying hair. That's going to be on your tombstone. Here's lies Harold. He tried. But another really good exercise is to do that three-line exchange, but use a silence in there, a pause. Somebody asks a question, and instead of an answer, put in a pause and see how that affects the conversation, uh, how it affects the, the power set up between the two people. Um, so great dialogue uses the world. It uses objects. Uh, what's being said plays off every object, uh, every bit of landscape, like Harold, here's a party going on, like here he is being lectured by his mother about something he did wrong. And, and down the street, there's a party going on. So it's a really nice 
it gives a nice dimension to what he's going through. Is of course he's going to hear people having fun somewhere else, or see somebody riding a bike away. It's like he wishes he had that freedom. You don't have to say he wishes. All he has to do is see that Parker kid on a bike, and uh, we get it that there is freedom elsewhere. Uh, so use objects, use landscape to play off of the subject matter of your dialogue. Uh, the teacher gives you the third degree. You know, I was a bad kid, so I got that a lot. <laughs> and then have the kid doing something while the teacher is yelling at him. So it's like, I might not be saying anything as the teacher's grilling me, but I'm gouging fuck you into the desktop with my pen. Um, and uh, at any point, your character can look out the window. At any point, they can touch something, you know, play with a pull out a pack of cards. Um, and these are some of the, um, they're very helpful things when you're talking about um, uh, the di about dialogue. Uh, let's see, what else can I talk about? Dialogue. There's subtext. Here's another Diddy, and I just love Diddy and his dialogue. Again, played as it lays. The first time Mariah ever met BZ, <laughs> this is the very next chapter. Uh, don't get into that. The very first time Mariah ever met BZ had been at a beach house, and it was 2 o'clock on a week weekday afternoon, and it was the summer Carter was cutting Angel Beach. I've got a meeting at the beach with this guy from San Francisco I told you about, Carter had said. You should come along and swim, okay? A, first line of dialogue, come along and swim. I don't feel like swimming. All right, so already there is tension, there is conflict. Um, there's something going on in the subtext here. You can come along and swim. And she's like, I don't want to swim. Well, that could be she just doesn't want to swim. But I don't think so, because there was already that conflict in the earlier scene. So we're watching. I don't feel like swimming means, like, uh, there's something he wants me to do here. And I don't want to do it. Don't want to do it, Carter. Um, and then he says, Mariah, Carter had said finally, he's going to maybe put up some money maybe, all right, like, I want you to come swimming because somehow that's going to help me get the money. So I don't know what you mean by swimming exactly, what he means by swimming exactly, um, but definitely wants her there uh, to help him get the money. Oh, God, it's so brilliant. Um, so it's all subtext. He doesn't have to say uh, and he doesn't care what she thinks. That tells us about their relationship. I don't care. You don't want to go swimming. Maybe it's, you know, he means swimming in the nude as a way of, you know, sweetening the deal uh, with his movie. Um, but uh, it's very clear he is trading her for money, and he'd be happy to, is happy to trade her for money. Uh, good dialogue does that kind of thing. Uh, what else do we have? Um, and then we talked about characterizing vocal tones, that gesture and voice and vocal tones, very important to be able to do that when you do dialogue. This is a dialogue scene from a wonderful novel by Samantha Dunn called um, uh, Failing Paris. And it's about a... a an exchange student from the Southwest, uh, from a poor family who is in Paris. And so this is a scene with her Parisian roommate. Um, we're going to think about vocal tone. Think about, she's speaking French, so qu'est-ce qu'il y a? I don't speak French, I speak Russian. <laughs> but that's my best. What's the matter? So that's something else when you have a bit of dialogue in a foreign language and just immediately translate. 
I mean, in my new book, um, The Revolution of Marina M., uh, the character is supposed to be speaking Russian. So I have bits of Russian in there, and uh, I immediately translate just like that. You don't have to tie yourself in knots. So, Keskis Kilia, what's the matter? I listen to this Pascale's voice, its small tone with no resonance makes me think of a porcelain bell mom gave me once with greetings from Pecos, Texas, in rolling paint script on one side, a picture of a bronc rider on the other. So we get, in that description of the roommate's voice, we not only hear the quality of her voice, no resonance, little bell, but then we get it opens a little door to memory inside the character. And that's just a line, and then we're back into the dialogue. Um, Krien, nothing, I tell her, pulling the blankets tighter around. So then we're lying, because we know that she is extremely depressed um, and having a very hard time, but she says nothing. So Krien, nothing, I tell her, pulling the blankets up around herself. So the gesture tells you the lie that she's being very protective of herself um, while she's saying that nothing's wrong and people do that all the time. Gesture is more important than almost more important than what people say. You always have to have the million dollar line. You always have to have the interesting line. But gesture tells you even more. So don't forget to, to make, you know, study gesture, write it down, get it in your notebooks, get just pages and pages and pages so that when you're writing a scene like that, you can go back into your notebook and find some really expressive gestures which will say what the character is not saying. Um, so that is a good place to end the dialogue scene number two. And I think we'll do some more next time on, uh, on dialogue, multi-character dialogue scene, which is spinning the plates with other people. I mean, how many plates can you spin at once? Um, so what we have so far is that dialogue explains nothing, that there is, continues to be the world, and so you continue to describe the world. It's a, it's a um, landscape is a spell that fades as soon as you cast it. You have to keep casting it. Um, that there is an interior and an exterior in a dialogue scene. The character is always thinking, always responding, always observing. Um, there's an easy digression into the interior world. You saw it with the bell, how easy that was for her to think the bell and then go inside and have a little memory about her mother and uh, this gift, you know, welcome, welcome to Pecos, Texas, um, which tells you a lot about the family. It tells her about her background, sort of a kitschy object. Um, it incorporates action, physical action, gestures, they handle things, they move across the floor, they wash dishes, you know, have your character doing something while they're speaking. Don't just have talking heads. Terrible place to have um, dialogue or two people sitting at a table having dinner. If you can do anything else, have them walking, have them having a smoke out in the alley, having them in the parking lot, have them, you know, riding horses, anything you can do to have people have motion while there's, um, while there's a dialogue scene. And then you weave everything into it. So don't just think of dialogue. Think of the dialogue scene, which is everything. Um, uh, remember, it uses reactions. It's sparing on the attributions. It's about lying and playing games. It's um, characters thinking and speaking in a characteristic way, individual way. Be aware of sound. There's always ambient sound, and when people stop talking, you hear the sounds. Um, use the silence. Um, 
you know, show us, show us your characters. People watch each other, and it reveals the intimacy between characters. So the best dialogue is between people who know each other very well. And the, the conflict is already loaded and ready to go. So I wish you good writing, and I'll be back next week. Um, I think, see anything coming up? I'm going to be having my class at Esalen uh, with Pico Yer in the Traveler's Journal. Uh, the Traveler's Journey, uh, the Traveler's Practice, Journey and Journal. So about presence and about writing and how to, uh, you know, make a Traveler's Journal worth keeping. Um, so I wish you good writing and uh, we'll talk to you next week. <laughs>